There were two men, a man named Ronald James Reed who worked as a mechanic at a gas station for 25 years and also worked part-time as a cleaner at a store for 17 years. His income from both jobs was modest and his education was also modest. The second man, Richard Fuscone, held a master's degree in business administration from Harvard University and was an executive at a large company. He had a shining professional career to the extent that he retired in his 40s. In 2014, the first man, Ronald James, passed away at the age of over 90 years old, and he bequeathed $1.2 million to a local library and $4.8 million to a hospital in the county where he lived. This was part of the wealth he left behind, estimated at $8 million. The second man, Fuscone, filed for bankruptcy in 2008, standing before a bankruptcy judge and saying, I have no income at the moment. He eventually collapsed and became bankrupt and indebted. How did a man in a modest profession with an ordinary education leave behind a large sum of money, while a man with a high financial education and a distinguished professional career ended up bankrupt? Ronald James Reed did not win any lotteries or inherit any money during his lifetime. He saved as much money as he could and invested it in established companies, leaving his wealth to accumulate over the years. Richard Fuscone borrowed large sums of money to expand his house with 11 bathrooms, two swimming pools, seven garages, and elevators, with a maintenance cost of up to $90,000 per month. After the 2008 crisis, Fuscone went bankrupt due to high debts and illiquid assets. Can we hear similar stories in other fields? It is impossible to imagine a story talking about Ronald, for example, performing a heart transplant operation and being better than a surgeon who graduated from Harvard, or that he was better than Hideki Yukawa in nuclear physics. But why do we hear similar stories in the field of investment? Most of the time, the financial field is known as a science with precise rules and laws, like physics. But Morgan Housel argues that this is not entirely accurate. For example, the reason for the collapse of a bridge can be explained accurately because its construction was based on precise knowledge, which is architectural engineering. Therefore, the reason for its collapse can also be explained accurately. However, the cause of the economic collapse in 2008 cannot be determined with the same precision. So, financial success is not a difficult or precise science, but it is, in fact, a soft skill in which behavior surpasses knowledge. A regular person who knows how to behave can become wealthy, while a financial genius who loses control over his behavior can become a financial catastrophe. This is what explains the success of a person with a modest education and a simple professional career like Ronald James Reed and the failure of another person with a prestigious financial education and an impressive professional career like Richard Fuscone. So, what is this soft skill? In 2018, financial journalist Morgan Housel wrote a report in the Wall Street Journal that outlined the flaws and major reasons for behavior affecting people when dealing with money. He called the report the psychology of money. Two years later, he delved deeper into the subject in a book with the same name, The Psychology of Money, which is the soft skill he argues is more important than the technical side of money. In other words, how you behave is more important than what you know. This book is completely different from almost everything written about money, as it starts from the idea that financial success is not simply related to your intelligence, but is closely related to how you behave, and studying money from a psychological perspective gives us a deeper understanding of the reasons for failure and factors of success. From his point of view, investing is not a test of intelligence as much as it is a test of character. The book is divided into several independent ideas that can be read independently. You will find in the description box the timing of each idea if you want to listen to it directly or refer back to it later. Tell us what are the most important ideas that you agree with. In 2006, two economists from the U.S. National Bureau of Economic Research, Ulrika Malmendier and Stefan Nagel, conducted research to find out what people do with their money. Theoretically, People should make their investment decisions based on their goals and the available options, but the researchers found that reality is completely different. 
investment decisions are made based on other factors such as their experiences in their generation, especially those in their early formative stages of development. Each person from a different generation and different environment has a different view of money and how to spend it. Depending on our era, where we live, and the environment we grew up in, we experience the world of money differently. The difference between a person born in 1970 and another born in 2001, or someone who lived in the Gulf and another in Africa, or someone who lived under an open system and another under a dictatorial regime, will be entirely significant. People vary in their generations, upbringing, and the values they were brought up on. They were born and live in different economies and deal with different labor markets, where luck, opportunities, and incentives vary. Therefore, we learn lessons in different ways and look at money from a completely different perspective. Each person has their unique experience in the world, and what they experience convinces them more than what they learn from another person. That is why each person has their unique financial perspective. A person who grew up in poverty thinks financially in ways that a person who grew up in wealth cannot understand if they tried. When people's views on money are formed in different worlds, their financial perspectives will inevitably vary. What seems logical to you may seem insane to another person, and this difference exists even among people who are very similar. Even the same person may make a wrong financial decision, but it is logical for them at that time. Now let's know how luck and risk play a role in your life and financial success. In 1968, after the efforts of a math teacher named Bill Dougal, a computer was brought to Lakeside High School near Seattle, which was an exceptional thing. Even in most graduate schools at universities, computers were not at the level of the one brought to high school. There was a 13-year-old boy who was passionate about this device, along with his friend. The computer was not part of the general high school curriculum, so the boys were able to work on it in their free time, on weekends, after school, and even late at night. Soon, they became computer experts. One night in front of the computer, the boy said to his friend, what if we could someday own a computer company? Perhaps this was part of children's talk, or maybe it was a waking dream. A few years later, in 1975, the boys founded that company, and now its value exceeds $1 trillion, Microsoft. The boy was Bill Gates, and his friend was Paul Allen, the co-founder of the company. The author tells us this story as an example of the luck that helped Bill Gates succeed. He says, it is true that he is a very intelligent and very persevering person with a vision in his teenage years in the computer field that most executives in the field did not understand, but his early start helped him a lot in that. Without the computer in his high school, there would have been no Microsoft. Even Bill Gates himself said in a speech to students at Lakeside High School in 2005, if there hadn't been a lakeside school, there would have been no Microsoft. Without his experience in high school, Microsoft would never have existed. Gates was truly fortunate to have had the opportunity to attend a high school that had a computer in 1961, one in a million chance. Kent Evans was Gates' classmate and close friend. He was also one of the lucky ones who worked alongside Gates in the school's computer lab. Why isn't his name mentioned in the story? because he never became a partner in Microsoft, as he died in a climbing accident before finishing high school. The chances of this tragedy happening were also one in a million. Kent Evans had the same ability and skill as his classmates, but he ended up on the other side of the game. The author says that the same probabilities exist in opposite directions, luck and risk are siblings, and both reflect the fact that success does not depend solely on individual effort. Luck and risk are factors present in any financial success, and if you think about it from this perspective, your view of any success, and even failure, will change. Years ago, Nobel Prize-winning economist Robert Schiller was asked, what do you want to know about investing that we don't know now? He said, the precise role of luck in successful outcomes. Is failure always the result of mistakes, or are there elements like risks embodied in bad luck? The media does not celebrate investors who did everything right and made good decisions but ended up on the unfortunate side due to risks that were not taken into account. 
they celebrate investors who made reckless decisions but were lucky in the end. These are two different sides of the same coin, so seeking to emulate success stories without differentiating between repeatable actions that lead to success and the role of luck and risk is not wise. According to the author, the role of luck may be significant in one's professional life, and the same luck cannot be replicated in another person's life. Instead, one can learn from studying a broader slice of people, whose successes are more applicable than extreme examples. We always ask about investment strategies and successful work, how to become wealthy, and we search for lessons of success and failure to do what the first did and avoid what the second did. We tend to assume that 100% of the results are due to effort and correct decisions, and we forget the factors of luck and risk in all of this. The most important thing is to realize the role of luck in success and the role of failure in failure. This book is completely different from almost everything written about money. It starts from the idea that financial success has little to do with intelligence but is closely related to how you behave. Studying money from a psychological perspective gives us a deeper understanding of the reasons for failure and factors for success. From their point of view, investment is not a test of intelligence as much as it is a test of character. The book is divided into several independent ideas that can be read separately. You will find the timing of each idea in the description box if you wish to listen to it directly or refer to it later. Tell us what is the most important idea or ideas that you agree with. In 2006, Ulrich Malmond and Stefan Nigel, two economists from the American National Research Bureau, conducted research with the aim of knowing what people do with their money. Theoretically, people should make their investment decisions based on their goals and available choices. But the researchers found that reality is completely different. Investment decisions are based on other factors such as their experiences in their generation, especially those early experiences in the early stages of adulthood. Each person from a different generation and different environment has a different view of money and how to spend it. Depending on our era, where we live, and the environment we grew up in, we experience the world of money differently. The difference between a person born in 1970 and another born in 2001 or a person living in the Gulf and another in Africa, or a person living under an open system and another under a dictatorial regime, is significant. People vary in their generations, upbringing, and the values they were raised with. They were born and live in different economies and deal with different job markets, where luck, opportunities, and incentives differ. We learn lessons in different ways and perceive money in completely different ways. Each individual has their unique experience in the world. What you experience convinces you more than what you learn from someone else. That's why everyone has their own financial perspective. A person who grew up in poverty thinks in a financial way that a person who grew up in wealth cannot understand if they try. When people's views of money are formed in different worlds, their financial perspectives inevitably vary. What seems logical to you may seem insane to someone else and this difference exists even among very similar people. Even the same person can make a wrong financial decision, but it can be logical to them at that time. Now let's find out how luck and risk play a role in your life and financial success. In 1968, after the efforts of a math teacher named Bill Dougal, a computer was brought to Lakeside High School near Seattle. The presence of a computer in a high school was exceptional, as even in most graduate schools at universities, there were computers, but they were not at the level of the computer brought to the high school. There was a boy at the age of 13, passionate about this device. He and his friend, the computer was not part of the general high school curriculum. So the boys were able to work on it in their free time, on weekends, and after school until late at night, and they quickly became computer experts. One night in front of the device, the boy said to his friend, what if we could someday own a computer company? Perhaps this was part of children's talk, daydreams perhaps. After a few years, specifically in 1975, the boys founded that company, and now its value exceeds a trillion dollars, that is, one thousand billion dollars. Yes, my wonderful friend, just as you guessed, it is Microsoft, and the boy is Bill Gates, and his friend is Paul Allen, 
the co-founder of the company. The writer narrates this story as an example of luck that helped Bill Gates succeed. He says, it's true, he is very intelligent and extremely persevering, and he had a vision in his teenage years in the field of computers that most executives in the industry did not understand. But his early start helped him a lot. Without the computer in his high school, Microsoft would not have existed. Even Bill Gates himself said in a speech to the Lakeside High School students in 2005, if there had been no Lakeside School, there would be no Microsoft. Gates was truly lucky. The opportunity for him to join a high school that had a computer in 1968 was one in a million. Kent Evans was Gates' classmate and close friend. He was also one of the lucky ones who worked alongside Gates in the school computer lab. Why then is his name not mentioned in the story? Because he never became a partner in Microsoft, as he died in a climbing accident before finishing high school. The chances of this tragedy occurring were also one in a million. Kent Evans possessed the same ability and skill as his classmates, but he ended up on the other side of the game. The writer says it's the same probabilities, but in opposite directions. Luck and risks are siblings, and both reflect the fact that the outcome does not depend solely on individual effort. Luck and risk are two factors present in any financial success, and if you think about it from this perspective, your view of any success, and even failure, will change. Years ago, Nobel laureate economist Robert Schiller was asked, what would you like to know about investments that we don't know now? He said, the precise role of luck in successful outcomes. Is failure always the result of mistakes, or are there elements like risks that manifest as bad luck? The media does not celebrate investors who did everything right and made good decisions, but ended up on the unfortunate side due to unforeseen risks. Instead, they celebrate investors who made reckless decisions but were lucky in the end. Two different sides of the same coin. Therefore, seeking to emulate success stories without distinguishing between repeatable actions leading to success and the role of luck and risks is not wise. Studying and attempting to deduce steps through studying the success or failure of a particular individual is dangerous. The greater the degree of success or failure, the higher the proportion of luck and risks in all of that. Trying to emulate Warren Buffett's investment, for example, is impractical because it is an extreme or exceptional case. According to the author, luck may play a significant role in one's professional life, and the same luck cannot be replicated in another person's life. Instead, we can benefit from studying a wider range of people for successes that are more applicable than extreme examples. We always ask about investment strategies and successful work, how to become wealthy, etc., and we search for lessons from success and failure to do what the former did and avoid what the latter did. We tend to assume that 100% of the results are due to effort and making the right decisions, forgetting the factors of luck and risks in all of that. The most important thing is to realize the role of luck in success and the role of failure in failure. This way, we can forgive ourselves when we fail and start anew. What is good is not as good as it seems, and what is bad is not as bad as it seems. Rajat Gupta was born in India. He was poor and orphaned in his teens, but he achieved great success and became the CEO of McKinsey, a prestigious investment company. When he retired in 2007, his fortune was worth $100 million. In 2008, he wanted to take advantage of insider information about Warren Buffett's $5 billion investment deal to help Goldman Sachs before it was made public. He bought 175,000 shares of the bank to benefit from the stock price increase. This earned him $17 million. It seems easy and wonderful, right? No, it was easy for the Securities and Exchange Commission to indict him and send him to prison because his actions were simply illegal. Bernie Madoff, convicted of running the Ponzi scheme or the scam of the century, as it is called, which lasted for 20 years, is said to have stolen nearly $50 billion during that time. He had a successful and legitimate investment company that generated annual profits ranging from $5 to $50 million before he turned to fraud. 
why does someone who owns hundreds of millions feel such a desperate need for more money? People might understand some crimes committed by those living on the edge of survival, but individuals like Gada and Madoff had everything material, enormous wealth, influence, prestige, freedom, and fame, yet they threw it all away because they wanted more. They had no sense of contentment. The higher the expectations rose with better results, the more they desired. Over time, they lose the satisfaction of their achievements, and the pursuit of progress becomes meaningless. The pursuit of any goal becomes meaningless as well. It becomes dangerous when it turns into greed for more, more money, more ambition, more power, more status, more fame. Their demand for more becomes stronger than their satisfaction, and every step towards the goal becomes a move of inadequacy, prompting them to compensate with more risk-taking. Social comparison often leads investors to look at those who have more than them and convinces them that they need to acquire more. Emotion-driven financial decisions based on how much money others possess can be destructive. Comparing your wealth to others is a losing battle because there will always be someone richer than you. The lesson to learn is that you should not risk what you have and what you need for what you don't have and don't need. If someone has enough to cover their needs and plenty of requirements, they should remember these things to avoid unnecessary risks. Stop chasing the goal as you get closer to it. Don't raise your expectations as your results improve. Accept that you already have enough and avoid comparing yourself to others, there will always be someone earning more than you. Let go of social comparison and say enough. Recognize that the desire for more will lead you to lose everything. Feeling content with what you have, even if it's less than someone else, is the way to win. Remember that things like reputation, freedom, family, friends, and happiness are not worth risking, no matter the gains. Now, let's discuss the extraordinary compound force during the Ice Age, a period in Earth's history when large regions were covered by layers of ice. There are multiple theories explaining the Ice Age, and the most accurate one, according to the author, is the Milankovitch theory. In short, this theory attributes the main cause of the Ice Age to cool summers rather than cold winters. The Ice Age begins when the summer is not warm enough to melt the previous winter's snow. This allows the remaining ice to accumulate, increasing the likelihood of a snow layer persisting into the following summer. This, in turn, attracts more ice accumulation in the subsequent winter, and the permanent ice reflects more sunlight, causing further cooling and more snowfall. This cycle continues, and within a few hundred years, which is short in geological terms, a seasonal ice mass grows into a continental ice sheet. The lesson here is that you don't need immense force to achieve exceptional results. A small start can lead to extraordinary outcomes that defy logic, to the point where you won't believe how simple the beginning was. Continuous growth eventually leads to astonishing results. The author, Warren Buffett, provides a financial example of this principle. I hear you thinking, but the author contradicted himself a moment ago by saying that attempting to mimic Warren Buffett's investment is impractical because it's an extreme or exceptional case. I thought about this as well when reading and summarizing the book, and here's my humble perspective. In reality, it's not possible to replicate Warren Buffett's experience, but we can learn from it and use it as evidence. For example, in this chapter, the author wants to say that the length of the investment period with consistent returns ultimately creates compound force. Many believe that his wealth is entirely due to his good knowledge of investments. But he invested for 75 years, starting at the age of 10. If he had started investing at the age of 30 and retired at 60 with the same annual return, i.e., 22% per year, he would have only accumulated $11.9 million over his lifetime, or only 0.1% of his current wealth. The key to good investment is not achieving the highest returns, it is earning good returns that can be repeated over a longer period of time. Now let's look at the opposite case, which is earning large returns but not being able to maintain them. Getting money is one thing, and keeping it is another. Jesse Livermore was the greatest stock trader of his time. He became one of the richest men in the world during one of the worst months in the stock market. 
the crash of October 1929. After this tremendous success, and after four years, he took more and more risks. He became so overconfident that he eventually lost everything in the stock market. Livermore went bankrupt, and his last days were tragic, ending in suicide. Most financial books talk about how to achieve wealth, but few of them discuss how to stay rich. Achieving wealth and staying rich are two different skills. The author says that the first requires risk-taking, which is an essential part of making money. But the second requires humility and some fear. Humility means not being deceived by your past successes and accepting that some of what you have achieved is at least attributed to luck and cannot be replicated. And fear, as the author means it, is the fear of losing what you have built at the same speed, which always reminds you not to go too far in taking risks. The author says, if we summarize financial success in one word, it would be staying power. That is the ability to stay for a long time without withdrawing or giving up. Taking on the mindset of staying power in any financial, investment, or business strategy is crucial for two reasons. First, to avoid extreme risks that may result in significant losses, especially sudden and unexpected ones that affect everyone. And second, the importance of compound force, as we mentioned before, which only works if given years and years to grow. Like an oak tree, for example, after one year of planting it, you won't notice significant progress in its growth, but after 10 years, the difference will be enormous, and after 50 years, it will be exceptional. Achieving exceptional financial growth and maintaining it requires surviving all the sudden fluctuations that everyone experiences. To apply the mindset of staying power, the author advises three things to make yourself financially unbreakable. Instead of focusing on big returns, especially during times of crisis, some opportunities may seem to offer significant returns, but the risks are also significant. Be prepared and expect that your plans will not yield results exactly as anticipated in the data table. Allowing yourself a margin of safety enables you to have flexibility when the randomness of life, politics, or the economy affects the desired outcome. This strategy increases your chances of success. Be optimistic and skeptical at the same time. Be optimistic about your long-term success, but skeptical that the path to that success is filled with obstacles, difficulties, and unexpected events, etc. This will always be the case. You need short-term skepticism to keep you in the game long enough to capitalize on long-term optimism. The secret to success is the tail events. Tail is a statistical term, and tail events are rare occurrences. In the mid-1930s, Disney had produced about 400 cartoon films, making almost no profits before producing the cartoon film Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs in 1938. It achieved $8 million, completely changing the studio's situation and enabling them to pay off all their debts. There are areas where a person must be perfect all the time, such as piloting an aircraft, while others require being good most of the time, such as being a chef in a restaurant. But in investing in business, a person can be wrong half the time and still achieve financial success, thanks to tail events. Amazon, for example, works on many failed, and sometimes catastrophic, products like the Fire Phone. It loses a lot because of that, but it compensates for it with products like Amazon Prime and Amazon Web Services, which are companies' cash cows. They were not considered essential products for Amazon when they were launched, but they succeeded. In other words, for every Amazon Prime, there are many failed products that people often don't see. They only see the final successful product and don't see the losses incurred along the way. The most successful companies are those that conduct the most experiments to produce an extraordinary product. Even though they may regularly make investment mistakes, they are generally right. What do you think is the greatest return that money brings? Let's find out. The author says that his desire when he was in college was to become an investment banker, and his sole motivation was to make a lot of money. He was 100% sure that he would be happier by getting that job. He joined an investment bank for a summer internship during his first year, and on his first day, he was surprised by the difficulty of the work. 
The bankers worked long hours, and going home before midnight was considered a luxury. He says the job was intellectually stimulating and made him feel important, but he became a slave to his manager's demands every second. This job was one of the most miserable experiences in his life. The training period was four months, but he endured only one month. It was even more miserable because he was working in a job he was confident would make him much happier. Why? Because he lost control over his life and his time. He says the hardest part is that he loved the work and wanted to work hard, but when work is scheduled and beyond your control, it gives you the feeling of working in a job you hate. Money, social status, fame, or material possessions are not what ultimately brings happiness. In America, for example, their financial conditions have improved significantly over 60 years, but there is little evidence that its citizens are happier today than they were in the 1950s. In a survey conducted by Gallup, 45% feel worried compared to the global average of 39%, and 55% of Americans feel a lot of stress compared to 35% in the rest of the world. Money cannot buy happiness, but the greatest return it offers is control over your time, to do what you want, when you want, with whom you want. It allows you to earn more time and provides more possibilities. If you have a certain amount of money that can sustain you for a year, you will have flexibility in facing some of life's ups and downs, such as losing a job or experiencing a minor health issue that prevents you from working. Now let's talk about the least return that money brings. The author of the book wrote a letter after the birth of his child, saying, You don't want a luxury car or a big house, but rather respect and admiration from others. These things bring you a sense of validation. However, you won't achieve that, especially from the people you want to respect and admire you. The author learned this after working in a valet parking service, observing how owners of luxury cars enjoyed the attention from others. However, they failed to realize that most people were impressed by the car itself, not the driver. People tend to desire wealth as a signal of their own likability and greatness. Ironically, others don't see it that way. Instead, they think about how much others would admire them if they owned the same things. They use the wealth of others as a standard to become objects of love and admiration. True humility and genuine empathy bring you greater respect than a luxurious car or a big house. Now, let me ask you, do you know the difference between wealth and richness? A person can be rich with an income that allows them to buy a beautiful car or a big house. But the only way to be wealthy, as the author says, is to not spend all the money you have. This is not the only way, but it is the definition of wealth. Wealth needs to be distinguished from richness. Richness indicates current income, such as a person who owns a $100,000 car is a rich person. In reality, we won't have difficulty recognizing the rich because they strive to define themselves as such. But wealth is hidden. It is unspent income, and its value lies in providing options and flexibility to purchase more than what a person can afford at the moment. Wealth is all the things we haven't spent. It's the luxurious cars and big houses we haven't bought, the jewelry and watches we haven't worn. Certainly, the wealthy also spend a lot of money, but even in such cases, what we see is their richness, not their wealth. Their wealth is hidden in assets, accounts, investments, etc. We see the homes they bought, not the ones they could have bought. The world is full of people who appear ordinary but are actually wealthy, and others who appear rich but are on the verge of bankruptcy. Remember this when you judge the success of others and when you set your future goals. But if wealth is what we don't spend, what's the point of it anyway? Sam and John are two brothers who inherited the same amount of money, let's say $1 million, and started investing at the same time. Sam was a better investor and earned a 25% annual return, which amounts to $250,000. John earned a 15% return, which is $150,000 per year. However, Sam had a higher spending rate because his lifestyle increased as his income increased. He spends $240,000 per year, while John, on the other hand, 
is more efficient in managing his money and spends $100,000 per year. After 10 years, John will have accumulated $500,000. While Sam only managed to accumulate $100,000, despite being a better investor than John and having a higher annual return on his investments. Building wealth is more closely related to your savings rate than your income or investment returns. It is possible to build wealth without a huge income, but it is not possible to build it without savings. However, most people in their pursuit of wealth focus on increasing their income rather than trying to curb their spending first. This is more of a psychological issue than a financial one. Once you meet your basic needs and some comforts or luxuries, your spending will be driven by your pride to show people that you have money. Your savings are the gap between your income and your pride. If you can restrain your desires and be less concerned about what others think of you, you will be able to save more. The author says that one of the most powerful ways to increase your savings is not by increasing your income, but by raising the level of humility. Therefore, the ability to save is completely under your control, unlike increasing your income, which you often cannot control. And don't forget what we said earlier, that controlling your time and choices is the greatest return money can bring you. This is the most valuable currency in the world, so consider starting to save now, and before that, start by reducing your expenses today. Can the same plans and strategies of the past be applied to future plans? The Fukushima nuclear disaster occurred in Japan in March 2011 due to an earthquake and tsunami. The reactor was built to withstand a worst-case scenario earthquake, but the surprise was that the 2011 earthquake was worse. This is what happens in investing all the time. Economists and investors often use history and past data as a guide to the future. It is wise for a person to have a deep appreciation of economic and investment history as it helps understand the origins of some mistakes and calibrate expectations, but it is not a map of the future in any way. The interesting paradox in the history of investing is that the more you look back, the more likely you are to be looking at a world that no longer exists today. Many investors and economists feel comfortable knowing that their expectations are supported by decades, and even centuries, of data. The evolution of the economy and the shift from industry to technology and information have led to increased competition among seekers of opportunities. In the past, a person, for example, only competed with people in their own city, but now you are competing with millions from all countries. Let's take the classic investment book, The Intelligent Investor. Many of the ideas presented in it are no longer relevant to today's world because data, circumstances, and even the economy have changed since 1949. Even the author, Benjamin Graham, said in his later years in 1976 that he no longer believed in the techniques of selecting individual stocks that he had established 40 years prior because the world was no longer the same. There is another factor that should be considered when developing financial plans. Let's find out what it is. The end of history illusion is a concept in psychology that emerged in 2013. It is a psychological delusion in which individuals of all ages believe that they have witnessed significant self-development and changes in tastes up until the present moment. But they will not grow or mature fundamentally in the future, they will remain as they are. Despite the awareness that their perceptions may have evolved, individuals predict that their perceptions will remain almost the same in the future. Therefore, many people engage in long-term financial planning, unaware that their goals and desires change over time. Long-term financial planning can be more challenging than it seems. It is difficult to make long-term permanent decisions when a change in perspective is likely regarding what you want in the future. Accepting the idea that the financial goals you set 10 years ago no longer apply to you because you are a different person now, you can abandon them and replace them. This can be a good strategy to reduce regret in the future. After that, you need to define your own financial identity. You can talk to informed friends or read books by financial experts to develop your understanding of investment. But do not strive to blindly imitate others because they do not have the same worldview, financial goals, or play the same game. Start by asking yourself about the game you are playing, how to play it, 
and what your financial goals are, etc. When your mission is clear, you will be less inclined to imitate. I will provide you with an article in the description box about how to set financial plans. In the end, the author says that they do not know your desires, when you want them, or the reasons behind them. They will not tell you what to do with your money, but they offer you some concise recommendations that will help you make better, actionable financial decisions. It is a summary of everything we have said. Do your best to be humble when things are going well and be forgiving and merciful when things go wrong. Reduce your arrogance to increase the likelihood of achieving wealth. Saving is the gap between your arrogance and your income. Make your financial decisions in a way that allows you to sleep well at night. Time is the most powerful force for investment, so broaden your time horizon. Be humble, kind, and compassionate. You will gain more respect and admiration by being these qualities than by buying things to impress others. Save only for the sake of saving, not to buy something or go on a vacation. Saving is the best protection against the unexpected, which may happen at the worst possible time. Give yourself a margin of error between your expectations and reality. This will give you the ability to stay in the game and benefit from the compounding power. Your goals will change and evolve, so avoid making extreme decisions that you will regret. Define the game you are playing and make sure you are not influenced by people playing a different game. In the end, my friends, I hope I have not taken too long, and I hope that money and your pursuit of wealth are a means and not an end. It is a means to bring happiness to those around you, do good, help people, and bring smiles, not an end in itself for arrogance, extravagance, appearance, and injustice. Thank you for listening.